Yo, my peoples, welcome to Rants and Randomness. I'm Lovey Ajayi, your side-eye sorceress, and this is my podcast where I'm talking about things I'm loving, things I am judging, and interviewing really, really cool folks. I'm here at the Chicago Recording Company, bring y'all the radio voice as always. And on this episode, I'm feeling good about my Dublin trip, and I'm ranting about voicemails and why I hate them and what I've done about that hate. And then spotlighting Tiffany Aliche, the budget nista. And I'm interviewing brilliant writer Damon Young. So let's jump into it. So I'm feeling good about the love I got from my Dublin trip. Um, I was invited to keynote the International Coaches Federation's um, annual conference, their Global Leaders Forum. And I, uh, my presentation was called Creating Authentic Brand Stories. And I went to Dublin for four days to do this. It was actually, uh, I was on stage five hours after I landed in Dublin. Yo, the love was real, okay? Um, it was basically a UN contingency of countries and nations. And people came up to me afterwards to talk about the impact that uh, my keynote had on them. Um, the Latin American contingent from Puerto Rico, Colombia, they were there. Nigeria, Ireland, Americas. ICF is the uh, biggest coaches nonprofit in the world. So being able to be on that stage is something that I don't take for granted. And being able to bring something of value and get to see the world while doing the thing that I love is the ultimate privilege. So I really want to thank them for having me and for bringing dope energy and for essentially making sure that my work is affirmed. So that was just really awesome. Um, And then I had a good time around Dublin. I essentially ate my way through Dublin. I found a Nigerian restaurant called Intercontinental Food Court. So I had some jollof. I had some agbono. I had some pounded yam. It was was decent. It was actually really decent because, you know, as a Nigerian, I can't go across the world and not try to find my food. It is an obsession. I had some plantains. Yes, I said plantains. Us Africans say plantains. Some agusi, um, all of that. Dublin was dope. Uh, basically walked around the city. It's kind of cold because it's March in Europe. But uh, Irish people were really nice, open. Yeah, it was a good time. So glad I went. Just got back. I did not get jet lagged because I didn't get myself used to the schedule in Dublin. So I was going to bed every day at 5 a.m. because it's five hours ahead of Chicago. So, yeah, I'm good. That is my recommendation. If you're going to be traveling out, out the country for less than a week, do not get your body used to that country schedule. So, but yeah, so that's what I'm feeling good about. Okay, so my rant this week is about voicemails. Why I hate them. Why I hope they stop. So here's the thing. Voicemails made sense in 1995 before everybody had free text messages and free nights and weekends uh, was actually not something you paid for. So voicemail made sense maybe 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when you weren't sure if you were going to get somebody, so you actually had to leave them a message because that's the only way they knew you were calling. Now, voicemail in 2019 is getting on my last nerves. Why are you leaving me a voicemail when you can email me if you called me and I don't pick up, or you can text me? So here's the thing. Whenever I get a voicemail, I instantly be like, oh, it's something else for me to do and add to my to-do list to check. It is not something that brings me joy, right? It's something else that I got to do. So whenever I have a voicemail, yes, I have the whole um, uh, voicemail to transcript thing. It's not a perfect science. Sometimes I'm like, I still don't know what this thing is saying. I still got to check it. So I decided to take it into my own hands, the idea that I don't like voicemail. Because my whole thing is, if we have boundaries that we can... um, exercise and we can let people know about and also control from our end, let's do that thing that can control it. So what I did was I called my phone company and I said, hey, can you delete my voicemails and deactivate my invoice? So I mean, my inbox so nobody can leave me voicemails. And they said, yes, literally, you can call your phone company. Let me give you this life hack. You can call your phone company and have them delete your inbox, so no one even has the option to leave your voicemail. If you are like me and you are somebody who deeply has come to resent voicemails, feel free to do that and free yourself, okay? Get this blessing in your life. And I know sometimes you're like, oh, I want to keep, you know, my dead grandmother's voicemail that she left me three years ago. 
which means you actually have to go into your inbox and resave the message over and over again. What I recommend for you to do is play that voicemail and record it on another device so you have that audio saved somewhere else so you don't have to depend on your voicemail to be where you can listen to this last message that's important to you. Again, I don't like voicemails. I don't like when people leave me voicemails, so I took it in my own hands to make it not even an option for people to be able to do. So call your phone company, get voicemail out your life. If anybody needs to reach you and the only way they can reach you is by leaving you a voicemail, that person is already not going to get in touch with you the way that they need to. So, yeah, that's my rant. Um, Let's leave less voicemails and let's do what we can about the voicemails that we get now. Call your phone company. All right, my spotlight on this episode is my girl Tiffany Aliche, who is known as the Budgetista. She's a financial expert. And I'm doing this spotlight because this woman is one of the most brilliant, most thoughtful women I know. Um, Tiffany started the Budgetista years ago, five, six, seven years ago. And her passion is that she wants to educate women, especially, on how to have how to be financially free by giving them actionable tips and and concrete hacks on how to be um, be able to be free from debt, how to build their savings, how to invest better. Because a lot of times financial education, we feel locked out of it. So Tiffany, uh, called the Budgetista, started her community called um, the Dream Catchers. Um, a few years ago, and I think they're now up to like 200,000 people, and where women are sharing information about finances, and she's giving them a four-on-one. She uses her story to basically anchor it because she remembers when she was in her 20s, she had an 800 credit score, and then the recession hit, lost her home, her credit score dipped to 547, and she built it up from there. What she's learned, the things that... um, are traps that she's avoided and just things that you might not know that can instantly change your financial life. Tiffany's also my Nigerian sister, my my West African Voltron sister, and she's now doing something called the Live Richer Academy, which is essentially a community to help people answer stuff on finance, credit, how to get your money together, and how to actually build wealth beyond getting out of debt, how to build wealth. I'm proud of her because, honestly, Tiffany is a person who I call whenever I have, like, money questions. I literally was about to buy my house, and I called Tiffany. I was like, Tiffany, do you think I'm in the right place to do this? Tiffany is just, she's one of the most open, thoughtful people I know. She's willing to share all the information that she has. And I know for a fact that my life is better because Tiffany's in it. And I think y'all need to know who Tiffany is. So follow her social. She is at the Budget Nista. B-U-D-G-E-T-N-I-S-T-A. The way she talks about money is super relatable. It does not feel like she's talking over your head. It does not feel like it's this thing that you can't reach. She makes it feel like you're talking to your best friend about money at brunch. And I, I've introduced my sister to her in terms of joining her academy. I always, any opportunity that I can big up what Tiffany's doing, I do. She's so dope that she's gotten the Budget Nista law passed in New Jersey that's going to require all middle school students to be given personal finance courses in school. Yo, that's game changing. Many of us would have spent our refund checks better if we really understood what it meant to take out all those student loans. So I just want to give her all the love because Tiffany is doing some real purpose work, some life-changing work. People always talk about how she's changed the game for them just because they took a class of hers or follow her on Facebook or Instagram. So anybody who's doing great work like this deserves all the props. So once again, y'all follow her on social media. She's at The Budget Nista on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Tiffany, thank you so much for the work that you do and for constantly giving back to people in this way. Damon. Hey. What's going on, sir? What's good? <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. It is a pleasure and honor to speak with you, sir, my very smart brother. What's going on? Man, you know, just out here living a life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but first, let me give people your bio to let them know who 
who I'm on the phone with, the epic Damon Young. <laughs> Damon Young is a writer, critic, humorist, satirist, and professional black person. <laughs> He's a co-founder of VerySmartBrothers.com, a columnist for GQ, a senior editor at The Root, and a, uh, a new rocking dude of a box cut. Um, <laughs> oh, Damon's, wow. okay. <laughs> Damon's first book, What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Blacker, a memoir and essays, is being released March 26th and can be pre-ordered now. If you listen to this show, odds are it's already come out, so you go ahead, you can walk into the store, whatever store it is that sells books, and pick it up. So, Damon, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Thank you for having me, and thank you for, for acknowledging my, um, my hair in the intro. That's that's the first time. Did you know that I like I've to had, do first. that I've what do you say? I like yeah, to do and first. you know, I've taken I've taken a lot of it's been a great effort to <laughs> to maintain my hair the way that I've that I have and I'm I'm glad that it's been appreciated. Because again, you don't know the work you don't know the the blood, sweat and tears that have gone into <laughs> maintaining it the way it's been. This is like this is like forty years in the making right now. Yo, are you like deep conditioning every week and stuff like that? I don't you know, I don't deep condition. I do wash. I do wash frequently. <laughs> I wash like two, three times a week. What? That's and a lot. Is that a lot? Well, you know what when I had when I had less hair, when I had like a fade, I was washing my hair every day. What? Um yeah, I mean, and the thing is, it's not like an expensive process when you don't have a lot of hair. You just put shampoo in, and you rub it around, then you wash it out, and then that's it. <laughs> and, like, you don't have to, like, you don't have to, like, dry. You don't have to, like, do nothing else other than wash it. So it's basically like washing my face. And now that I have a little bit more hair, I don't wash it as frequently, but I, I am washing it. And um, And I also have experienced bad hair days, which I didn't know was a thing. What I didn't Welcome. realize it was an actual thing. I thought it was like this like a dramatic thing that people who had hair would <laughs> say. But it's an act- I, I do have bad hair days where there are days when my hair doesn't look this it's like it's just a little it's a little off. I can't really describe how, but it's just like yeah. I am excited that you are here. <laughs> like I'm excited that you are at the point where you're like, I have bad hair days because listen, it has not been propaganda this whole time. I felt like it was. I felt like you all were like trying to bamboozle like people who didn't have bad hair days <laughs> and like the populace who just like woke up like this like every day. And and so now I now I get it. Like it's not it's not a conspiracy. It's it's, it's <laughs> actual it's actual factual. I feel like you need to send out a memorandum to other dudes who just be like, Oh man, y'all don't have bad hair days. You all good. Mm mm. Yeah. I mean I um we keep it at 100. I have bad hair. I have bad beard days. I have bad beard days now. Ah, uh, do you where really? There are days when, when my beard is a little, it's a little, it's not as symmetrical <laughs> as it could <laughs> <to me>. be. <laughs> it's not as, it's not as luscious. Lord. Damon Young has become high maintenance. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Damon Wayne, designer sneakers now. We'll get, we'll get to that part. Cause I, yeah. Mm-hmm. So Damon, what did you want to be when you were growing up? Um, it depends on when you ask, because mm. when, if you'd, have, if you'd have got me, if you'd have asked me when I was seven or eight, I would have told you I want to be a weatherman. Wait, a who? A, a meteorologist. Oh, okay. You wanted to be a weatherman. Yeah, okay. A weatherman. Yeah. And, um, that, 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 that came from being stuck in a, in a, in a really bad thunderstorm when I was like six or seven and like Thunder, lightning, hail, all this shit. I was like locked outside the house for whatever reason. And from that, that point on, I I became so frightened of lightning and of and of like those sort of severe storms that I did what I could to learn as much about them. Wow. So I would buy all these weather books. I would watch the weather channel obsessively. I would buy the USA Today just to read the color-coded weather map on the back of the A section. <laughs> and it got to a point where, and, and I could still, you go outside, I could still name, like, clouds. Like, like yeah, that's a cumulonimbus. That's a Sarah Stratus. Like, I could, I still have a lot of that knowledge from from 30 years ago, still retained. So there was a minute where I wanted to be, that's what I wanted to be when I grew up. And then once I realized that saying that out loud, 
was a really easy way to get disinvited to birthday parties. <laughs> I um I I kind of latched on to basketball, which was that was like my thing. And um, even though I wouldn't tell people out loud that I wanted to be an NBA because I already knew that that was like a stereotype for like a young black kid, like oh you want to be a ball player or rapper. So I did want to be a ball player, but I didn't actually say it because I don't want to like fit the stereotype. <laughs> um, but if you if you would have asked me honestly, sincerely, I've been like, yeah, I want to be an NBA. And what age did you change from uh, weather dude to NBA? Uh, I pro- uh, probably like probably like ten, ten or eleven. And you were actually good 11. at basketball. And I was like, I was actually good. I mean, I got um, I got an actual scholarship to college to play basketball. Like they gave me actual money to go to school. How did your I parents had deal? No student loans. Did you were your parents like, yes, I could totally see you in the NBA, or were they just like, this is a hobby? Well, no, my parents were, some, you know, my dad who, and my dad was like my first and my like most prominent teacher when it came, when it came to basketball, and so with them it was more about I recognize our son has this talent, and so maybe if he gets good enough. He'll get someone to pay for college for him, and that's that's what ended up happening. So that was their goal. Like they, but you know, they they weren't. You know, maybe my dad also had like some sort of professional basketball aspiration for me. I don't know, but the professed goal is the is the um, the college thing. Mm. So you grew up in the '80s in Pittsburgh, which uh-huh. is not the most diverse place. <laughs> Uh-uh. <laughs> How was that? I mean, I feel like answering that question is like asking like a fish. So how how was that water? How was it like <laughs> living in water? It's all you knew, huh? Yeah, it's, it's all it's all I knew. I didn't really know anything different because that's how I grew up and that's just where I was from and you know, the perspective I have now lets me know that informs me that yeah, Pittsburgh, you know, there are a lot of cities that are a lot more diverse, have a lot more black people, have like black middle class and you know, just 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 a more robust um and, and a in a more I'm not gonna say valued, but um just a more prominent um mm. just black neighborhood or black political um, atmosphere or, or whatever. And those are things that Pittsburgh never really had and does, doesn't really have now. And so I think that just to answer that question, being black in Pittsburgh is dealing with a perpetual claustrophobia. Mm. Um, because you, you know, you're surrounded by you're surrounded by whiteness everywhere, even in the pockets of blackness that you might be able to find and might be able to to cultivate. You're still surrounded everywhere by whiteness, which I guess is is America really at large. Now, there are certain cities where that might not be the case, but the country that is America mainly, like you leave Chicago and, you know, you could be two minutes away from a Trump rally. And, Mm -hmm. um... And I feel like Pittsburgh is like a microcosm of, kind of a microcosm of the black experience in America. I, I think but I've been instead to of twice. being one of those, instead of being one of those like relatively safe spaces, it's it's the space where you know that claustrophobia is really just exaggerated. So how did you, as the Tall black kid who played basketball navigate that, and and I'm sure some of the whiteness includes some caucasity about you being a tall black kid playing basketball. Well, you know, to, to be to be honest, playing basketball granted me like almost like this perpetual force field, mm. uh, where you know I, the neighborhood I grew up wasn't like the safest. There were bloods and crips and shootings and and all that, but I was protected because I hooped and you know in, in neighborhoods like that you know as bad as they can be sometimes there's still sometimes can be like a bit of a code 
where like the you know the hustlers and the dope boys or whatever they don't really fuck with the kids who who are half like an athletic talent or have like mm. an academic talent and and so because I knew all of them and I grew up with all of them and some of them were like my homies too you know I didn't really you know I didn't have to I didn't get in all the fights and do all the things that some of the other kids did because again I had that oh, oh that's Amy Hoops he's cool and even you know in just thinking about just what would happen once I left the neighborhood I had the same sort of protection um, where if you play basketball and you're and you're a man who plays basketball or plays any plays basketball and football specifically um, there is a level of I'm I'm not going to say that you are, um, you know, that you're completely immune to whatever happens, you know, whatever racial animosity is this out there, but um, you are sheltered in a way from it that that kids who maybe don't have that sport background might not be. Um, And that even extended when I was in college, you know, where... um, I had boys who, you know, friends, men, men and women who, you know, weren't, were just regular students. And I would talk to them, you know, at lunchtime and at parties or whatever. And they would talk about these issues that they had with financial aid and issues they had with this professor and issues they had with the campus security and this and that. And because I was on the basketball team, I didn't really have to deal with those things on that same level. Makes sense. It's it's a yeah. buffer. Yeah, and it's, you know, and I think it's, you know, to pretend that my experience was any other way would be, I don't know, it wouldn't just be wrong, it would be dangerous because, you know, that's just not the truth. Um, and the truth of the matter was that, you know, being good at a sport did give me, it, it, I mean, it, it, may, it makes you hyper-visible, but it also gives you almost like this, this, this fabricated and and really flimsy shield, but a flimsy shield is better than than no shield. Mm, that's real, especially when you look. A flimsy shield is better than no shield. So, you started going to college playing basketball. What was your major though? Was it like leisure studies? <laughs> <laughs> I'm only saying. I know it wasn't, but what was your major? Well, may, uh, so I started off as like I think sports management, okay. um, and then I um, I ended up transitioning to uh, English. What made you make that transition? Um, I was I I had always been into writing. Um, writing had always been just a thing that I am interested in and I had a bit of a talent with. I mean, even going back in high school, I wrote for the school newspaper and I ran the sports section, so I was writing articles about myself. <laughs> In the sports section at the school newspaper. Damon Young scored twenty two points as <laughs> in those Indians, you know. <laughs> that crossover um, was, was 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 highly legit. They were like, Sir <laughs> And so yeah, writing at writing always been a thing. And also, you know, I went to school, my freshman year was nineteen ninety seven. Okay, so I went to school in the late nineties, early aughts. And this is around the time if you if people, you know, who are around my age or, you know, a little bit younger, a little bit older, remember how, how big poetry was back then. Yes. And like, the slam, like just the whole spoken word slam poetry mm-hmm. at those eras, like guys, like it was, that was, that, that was like the pinnacle of that, of that movement. Like, it's like today, I feel like brunch and like the day party and like that, <laughs> the game night. Those are like the, those are like the fulcrums of like of like bougie blackness, like where people go to meet and yep. people hang out. And then it was like the 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 lounge where they read poetry. That felt like that was the fulcrum back then. And you know, and there are all these. If you look back, there's a lot of media. That that expressed that you know you had deaf poetry that was on HBO, you had um, that movie Slam with Saul Williams. I mean Saul Williams was a was a was a household name. Yeah. For you know the 
in like this this great poet. Yep. Um, everyone, you know, everyone with a black panda page had like Tony Morrison, had like uh, <laughs> not Tony Morrison, Facts. um, but um, what's her name, Maya Angelou. Yep. You know, quotes. We thought we were <laughs> very like, deep in the nineties. Yeah, everyone, everyone was so deep, and you know, the thing that was like the, I feel like the most important part of that whole, and the whole zeitgeist was uh, Love Jones. Yep. Um, and Love Jones kind of it. It was a part of like as and also I think had a role in creating it because it made that that whole culture a bit more mainstream. And anyway, I'm bringing that up because I wanted to be Darius Love Hall. <laughs> okay. And so I became I, I like transformed myself from like the Averex and Gold Chain and Timberland rock and nigga that I was when I first got on campus to I'm wearing pea coats. <laughs> I'm wearing koofies. Black turtlenecks. <laughs> I'm wearing, I, I didn't do the turtlenecks. What? I didn't do the turtlenecks. I had rubber bands. I, used to, I, I wore like a thousand <laughs> rubber bands on my wrist. I, I had this like this thing I did with jeans where I would like cut the bottoms off of them so that the strings would be hanging. And I would like, I, I, I had a whole method just to make the jeans look really like season because I felt like season <laughs> jeans added character and I wanted all the character. Damon, so you and, you basically did the thing that people do where they're like, I want to look poorer than I am. Yeah. <laughs> and and this was the I wanna I I wanna be that I wanna be that poetry nigga. I wanna be known on campus as like the nigga that, that writes and, and reads poetry. Oh my because gosh. at that point in my career, the basketball thing, I didn't have a great college basketball career. I kept getting injured and you know, there was just a lot happening there. So I was like, I need to find something else to be known for and to kind of replace the status that I, that I lost with basketball and poetry became that. And, and also too, I mean, I was trying to impress someone, trying to impress a, a young woman that I liked a lot. And so I started writing her poems. Ooh. And the thing is by writing her poems, what I meant was, I would go on the original hip hop lyric archive. <laughs> I would take like the most obscure rap verses. <laughs> I would cut and paste them into an email. <laughs> Voila. Damn. Here, here, here is my poem that I wrote my all by myself to you. Did, did it work? Was she impressed? I mean, it worked in a context that she didn't know that I was plagiarizing. <laughs> oh um, but God. I was just stealing shit from like Method Man and Inspector Deck and, and saying it was mine. But it, it ain't. But in terms of getting her to like fall in love with me and like, oh, that bomb ass poetry got got me all got these bomb ass panties all wet and like that that didn't happen. <laughs> that 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 definitely didn't happen. So you were on the poetry stage. You switched your uh, major to English. You was wearing koofies around. Mm-hmm. What? Then you started blogging. Did you start blogging in college or after? I started blogging right after college, and in the blog, the blog actually sprung out of that poetry um, genesis, where um, my cousin um, Sarah Honey Young, who, unbeknownst to me at the time, was already a big ass internet deal. Yeah, I, I had no yep. idea that she that was like bitch. A dot com. Internet. Yeah, from that bitch. Dot com and the havoc message boards, and you know, has designed and created all these, you know, other you know, platforms um, that are iconic. She approached me and was like, hey, you know, I know you're writing these poems. You should let me build a website for you as as a place to archive these poems. And and she was like, and while you have these poems archived, you could do this thing called blogging, too. Wow. And so, and so yeah, she built the site for me. And that was in 2002. The Royal Youngs? Yeah. You know what's funny? You got the role, young.com. So, just so people know, Sarah Honey Young um, is a dope graphic designer. And back in the days when we all used to be on AOL Messenger, she popped up on this website that she created called thatbitch.com where she was blogging about her life, her family, her, her, um, her shenanigans in general. That's back when blogging was literally your online diary. And I, I don't know how I stumbled upon that bitch.com, but I was like, every day I check it, 
you know, after AOL stopped playing games with me and, and, and allowed me to sign on, and I think her site led me to yours. So mm-hmm. you had, like, a great background. Like, am I right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I started reading your blog. I can't remember what year, but it had to be uh, 2003, 2004? Damn, we old. We old. Yo, we so old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not. No, you. I'm not. You old. Oh. I'm not old. Oh, you see the, the, the under the bus throwing? Yeah, I'm I'm not old. You 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 old. You old, <laughs> damn. I, 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 I'll take it. Look, I got these gray hairs to prove it. It's cool. Yeah. So you st- okay, so you start at Royal Youngs. Now let's talk me through that. Well, it's funny, like you're talking about um talking about Honey's blog, Fat Bitch. And around this time that she created my that she created my blog, she was getting in a lot of hot water with our family mm. because they just discovered that she had started blogging. And, you know, you, you blog, you talk about all types of shit. You use all types of language. Um, and she was very transparent about, you know, some of the relationships that she was in and, you know, people that she knew and this things happening, you know, just this things that we consider right now, just mundane things that people tweet about, people write about, you know, whatever. But, she, um, once there were some people in our family that once they found out about it were like really upset with her and it became like this thing, you know, where there was like emails back and forth and phone calls and, 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 and all this, you know, all this unnecessary drama and, you know, just thinking about that. And, and then, you know, now 16 years later, I'm writing this book where, I'm I'm saying a whole lot more shit than she was saying in that blog. Mm -hmm. And it's all love. (sighs) You know, it, it shows you one, it shows you, I guess how, how things have evolved in a way, but you also can't help, but just look at just the gender disparity there where, you know, she's this young woman writing about these things, Mm -hmm. being very transparent, being very open and it's like oh you know maybe you shouldn't write about these things maybe you know you you're like disrespecting the family and when i do it it's like oh shit this is this is this is awesome this is brilliant this is amazing yeah the culture and, has shifted yeah yeah the culture has shifted and I, you know i want to be careful not to mischaracterize my family because they're they're awesome you know but it's just you know I know that she still feels that, I mean, she is a thousand percent supportive of me and everything that I'm doing now, but I know that, um, just the, the, the difference in how our work was regarded does thing a little bit. And, you know, and it's just one of those things where, you know, and, and it still happens today where the work men does and the work women does gets criticized a different way gets regarded a different way and there's yeah. like a different standard that's applied to it. Absolutely. I mean, people who rem- who remember her website, like it was essentially kind of like going to brunch with your best friend and having her give you all the tea about her life. Um, mm-hmm. And just back then, blogging was also not anything that it is today. Back then, it was there was no glory to it. There was there was usually that. There was usually that drama. Back in that day, when you yeah. wrote about your life, you end up catching drama about it some other way. So, what were you covering on the Royal Young? Your your first blog. I mean, it was. I was just talking about like I, I mean I was working at that at that time. I, uh, my first job was um, I was a high school. Uh, I was a, I was a sub. I was a, um, a substitute teacher at a high school, and then I ended up getting my own classroom. So I wrote about that. I wrote about my my dating misadventures. Um, I wrote about like just pop culture, you know, shit that I observed. Um, yeah, it 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 wasn't really that different than what I tend to write about now. Mm-hmm. Just in terms of. You know, just in terms of the, the topics now, the the way I write about them is different. But um, I've, you know, I've always found the, I guess, the bulk of my, of my content from just living, from life, mm-hmm. and observing. 
and and being in situations and and reacting to them and um and that's where the content came from then and that's where you know you know a lot of my work comes from now um i guess then i didn't write as much about politics as i do now i don't think any of so us I guess did. that's one <laughs> that's one definite um that's one definite change so then when did you end royal youngs and start vsb I was also um, I ended Royal Youngs in um, probably around 2016 or 20 or 2006 or 2007, um, and this was around the time when um, there were a lot of news stories about people um, getting fired because of their blogs. Mm. Like it, it felt like like you remember last summer when it felt like every every other day there was a new white person calling calling the cops on black people for mm-hmm. like it just seemed like. They all just drank the same tea and like, you know what? Like they all got the same signal. Like every white person in America got the same <laughs> signal to record black people sleeping or catching a cab or shopping at Foot Locker or right. a pickle. And like there were news stories like every day it felt like. Well, in 2006, it felt like there was that same sort of thing happening, but with people getting fired because of their blogs. It felt like I just kept reading and seeing in the news all of these different instances of these, you know, popular, not even really all that popular bloggers who, you know, their, their day jobs found out about it and then, you know, they got let go. And so that kind of spooked me and I decided to take, um, to take the site down. And, um, and at that point I'd already met Panama Jackson, who's the co-founder of VSB. And um, we we became friends back in like 2004. Um, we just uh, found each other's blog because at that point, the the blogosphere wasn't was still kind of in its infancy, right? And there weren't and there also weren't a lot of black men mm-hmm. who had those sort of personal blogs. And so we just kind of gravitated towards each other, stayed friends, and then in 2008. Um, um, we and um, another um, person, Liz Burr, came together and decided to do VSB. And um, the crazy thing about VSB, and, and I, I think you know this already, but so we met in 2004. We started VSB 2008. We didn't meet each other in person until 2011. Oh, yeah. And and, it, and it's not like and it's not like this nigga lives in Alaska. <laughs> I mean, he lives in DC. He lives in DC. And you in Pittsburgh. And I'm in Pittsburgh. That's a three and a half hour drive. You know, it's like a like a forty minute plane ride. And um, and yeah, we just never never met each other until until a party in DC in 2011. And that just whenever people try to make the distinctions about you know the the online life. And, and, and or try to make a distinction between online life and quote unquote real life. You know, I think back on that relationship that we were able to form mm-hmm. without ever even meeting a person. Right. And, you know, it just really just reinforces the foolishness of trying to make that distinction because the friends that you make online, those are, those are your real friends. Yeah. Those are your real people. Even if you don't see them, even if you've never seen them, those are still, I mean, those connections that you that you build with those people are real. Facts. So, Very Smart very smart Brothers then starts in 20, you said 2008? 2008. 2008. Yeah. Yo, I, that, let me tell y'all about VSB. VSB is probably half the reason why some of us had to do entrepreneurship because... We were probably not great employees because we would park <laughs> ourselves in the comment section of VSB all day, every day. I'm talking five days a week. Y'all's comment sections used to have thousands of comments each post. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, it was a thing where we we would post a thing at midnight. And and there would be battles to see who would leave the first comment. To be the first. Yeah. And and that would go on for like fifteen, twenty minutes and then people were already he had there, there's no way in hell he could have even read the post yet. And people are already like commenting. And people are literally saying in the comments, Okay, I've been here long enough. Let me go read the actual <laughs> post this. 
<laughs> let me go actually do the thing that I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and so, yeah, we, um, you know, in, in VSB, you know, it's just progressively continue building and, you know, we were able to build a community, this digital community, um, of, uh, people who would come, who would appreciate our content. And, and, you know, it got to the point where we started pulling people out of the, out of the comments to start writing their own pieces. Like, um, Shamir Ibrahim, for instance, um, is, has her own column at, um, I think at Vice. She has a column somewhere now. And she's written a bunch of different places and she was a person who started off in a VSB comment. Wow. And there are other people who work as editors and, and writers, other places who, you know, who were, you know, who were part of VSB and who got, who, um, comments from VSB. So I want to kind of set the, the, the lay of the land for people. VSB, so back in 2008, I blogging know. was much bigger than it is. And I don't think people understand the impact that VSB had on pop culture and just like blogosphere because... Now we think about blogs as, as these dying things or like these things that we read maybe twice a week. VSB was one of the drivers of conversation, especially before black Twitter was like a thing. So a lot of people actually end up meeting up in VSB comments or, I mean, y'all had people getting married who met off VSB comments. I mean, there are VSB babies. There are VSB, there are VSB babies. babies. Yeah, VSB marriages. There are VSB like, like 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 vacation getaways, they're like VSB brunches, VSB like fights. <laughs> <laughs> like people got got besties off VSB. Again, we used yeah. to be in those comments for hours, and I that was also back in the day when uh, yeah, it was before social media was as big as it is. So it was basically our our social media. Um, and I used to comment in there all the time, and people would use that to then go read my blog. And so for you, when you think back to VSB in the beginning, what do you think was the magic? Um, I mean, I, 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 I think it's a few things. I, I think there's a few things that, that, that came together and, and that helped us be who we were able to be. Um, you know, I, I think that um, both Panama and I have always kind of positioned ourselves as like, just like regular niggas. You know, like we're not like, okay, we have this, we have this platform, we're saying these things and that takes a certain level of, yeah, you know, we, if you write a thing and you believe that you're right. But I, 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 I also believe that there was just an inherent approachability. Um, and people didn't look at us as like, oh, there's these two people who are creating this thing and they're like these unapproachable. I, I feel like we were considered to be like cousins or, mm-hmm. or homies. Mm-hmm. And our space reflected that, where people just, just hung out and stayed. And we just we just were the host, basically. Um, and so there was that, and and you know I I do think that we were very consistent with our content, um, and that's one of the things that for anyone who was starting any sort of creative, you know, creative endeavor, whether it's you know a blog or you know any, any sort of similar platform, you're looking to create and build and cultivate like a community. You have to be consistent. People right. knew that they could come to VSB every day and there was going to be new content. And um, and when you're consistent like that, it allows people to, to, to make you a part of their routine. Um, so, you, so you get up in the morning, okay, I'm a, I'm a shower, I'm going to brush my teeth, I'm going to get some coffee, and I'm going to check VSB. Yep. And so when you're, when you're a part of that, then... Then, then you know it, it, it becomes almost like this second nature thing where people don't even think about going to the site. It's just like a thing that they do. Like you don't think about brushing your teeth. You just get up and you brush your teeth. And 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 I think that for the people who were part of our community, 
It wasn't like, oh, let me check what it's just, oh, I'm up. Just checking VSB is just what I do at this time of the day. And at this point, um, did you have did you have your full time job still? No, actually. I mean, when I started VSB in two thousand and eight, I was working at the King University. And I got laid off in 2009, the recession hit, and the whole program um, that I was working for was this college prep program shut down. And so I was, um, yeah, I was unemployed. I was on unemployment for, for there was an extended period of unemployment that you could be on because of the recession. However, the longest period of time you could be on unemployment was, I was on it for that period of time. Mm. I think it was, I think it was like 50 months or something like that. Uh, I'm sorry, not 50 weeks. 50 weeks, um, okay. Or, or 100 weeks or something like that. However however long the, the longest was, that's how long I was because I just couldn't get a job. Um, I applied for a couple of things that were also in academia and went on cover interviews and get hired. And so I just, um, I made a decision to like, you know what, let me let me see if I could build VSB and, and, and make a career writing full-time so um, when did VSB so, start wait no go ahead and when, I, when people ask about you know go on panels or you do a talk and people ask about like this certain origin story like so how they had this book deal you you know your blog was bought by Univision all this other shit how did this happen and you know I, I always just express the fact that it wasn't necessarily just like this conscious choice. Like I, I learned how to swim by getting kicked into the deep end of the pool mm-hmm. <laughs> where I didn't, I, I was like, you know, I'm not getting hired to do anything else. And I'll, and I've always had this aspiration of writing full time. So I need to get better at this because if I don't get better at this, I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to be able to make a living. So I need to I need to be successful here. At what point did you start monetizing VSB? Like when did it start making money? So- <laughs> ah, shit. Um it, it it depends on how you how you qualify monetizing because we never really made that much money off of the blog. Like we um when we made money through Google AdSense and we would have like sponsored posts, but we we didn't have like ads up or, and we didn't we didn't do the sorts of things that we probably should have been doing. Um, but, but the way that I was able to monetize VSB was, um, using it as a platform and like, uh, almost like this, uh, this, uh, this space, this sketch space to get better and then going off and getting freelance writing opportunities out of places. And then, um, 2012, I got, uh, I got a job with Ebony magazine. And oh. so... I was able to do all these other things and still maintain VSB. So while I wasn't making money off of VSB specifically um, or directly, I was making money off of what I was able to do because of VSB. Makes sense. Our stories are very parallel in that way. I got laid off in 2010, and I was like, oh, okay, let me figure this thing out. Um, for, For the process, at one point you were writing... Yeah, you were writing for Ebony, you had VSB. Throughout those years, how were you making sure you were keeping yourself f- sharp and fresh? Because you were consistent. You you were one of the few bloggers. And I think the other reason why VSB probably stood out is because blogosphere over-indexed in women. And mm-hmm. y'all were two black men who happened to have built a massive following. So it was kind of like it begets itself. So how did you, yeah, how did you keep yourself sharp and kept writing even through the times when you weren't making money? Desperation. Mm, that's real. That's real. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, it's like, all right, if you were to go outside and like right now and someone asks you to run as fast as you can for like 50 yards, you, you I, I'm, I'm assuming you haven't done any stretching or anything today. You might not be wearing running appropriate shoes. You might struggle to get to your top speed. But if they were to ask you to do that, but they put like a tiger behind you mm. <laughs> that is chasing you, then yeah, I, you would probably get to your top speed pretty quickly. 
And and so I, I just think about the question that you're asking about staying sharp and about honing, you know, your skills, whatever. And it was like, well, if I don't do this, then what the fuck am I going to do? True. Like, if I don't get better, then how am I, you know, this is, this is it. So I have to do these things. And, um, and I, and I think it, it would be, we, we should be mindful not to, not to minimize the importance of like, of that sort of desperation when it comes to ambition. Hmm. Um, and, and when it comes to just building a, um, building a platform, building a business, you know, and not everyone has it. You know, some people have different motivators and have had different forces that led them to be who they are. But for me, I mean, of course, I had the I had the interest in writing um, and in and in and in, and in, in just getting better at that and 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 being able to to do that um, for a living. But that desperation definitely mattered. So. When you um, when you look back on those times, like what do you think was the greatest lesson you learned? Um, that's a that's a good question. Um, I, I think um, there there's so many <laughs> there's, so, there's so many lessons, that, and you're talking about over like a decade. Yeah, man. It started VSB in 2008, and, you know, it's 2019 right now. Um, you know, you, you learn um, what you're good at. Mm-hmm. You learn, I guess, the importance of 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 not just staying in your lane, but, but, but making that lane as fruitful as it could be. Mm. Um, you learn discernment. Um, and, and you also, you learn from, from reading and, and that's, that's been like, I guess the most, for me, like one of the most valuable parts about having this platform and being connected with all these, you know, different blogs and different people and, and, and just being a consumer of content and of blogs and of articles and of books is the, the space that it gives you to learn <clears throat> right and to like read up on things that you you didn't know about and, and to get sharper and to get better and to, um, just to, just to, just to, you know, continue just being a student, continue listening, continue reading and, um, continue being intellectually curious because and you could tell the people whose, whose work stagnates, they don't have that curiosity or they might've had it and they don't have it anymore. Mm. And I don't want to, I even like today, I don't want to be that person who is like, who was stuck in 2002 right. or 2007 or 2013. I just, I just don't want to be stuck. Um, and, and I, and even though my financial circumstance and my professional circumstance, you know, dictates that I don't have to be as I don't, that, that sort of desperation doesn't need to drive me anymore. The remnants of it are still there. And the remnants of just wanting to continue to get better and continue to evolve, that that's still there because I um you know, I, I, I just don't want to be stuck. That that scares me as much as anything, is just being a person who who, you know, who is an 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 anachronism. Mm. I mean, y'all were anything but stuck because a lot of things happen with blogs where blogs close. Y'all end up being acquired by Univision. How did that come about? Um, well, it had been it had been in the works, you know, for for a minute where we, um, you know, they first reached out to first reached out to me in two thousand and fifteen. Okay. Uh, where um, Donna Bird was the publisher of the route then, and she reached out. And, and at that time, we'd actually already been doing some work with the route. We had a content share agreement with them where we would we would publish a certain amount of pieces a week, and, and we would give some of them to the route. So some of the more evergreen pieces, the route would publish first. 
and then we'd be able to publish it like three or four days later on VSB. I forgot exactly how the how the arrangement went. And through that, I was also writing original pieces for Root. So we already had like a, an arrangement. And um, and so I met with Donna in 2015 to, you know, just to talk about my plans for VSB and, you know, where I saw the, the site going. And that's when she first brought up the idea of some sort of like formal partnership or acquisition. This is late 2015. Now okay. it gets into 2016 and there are, other corporations that are interested, hmm. um, you know, and that are making offers too. And I felt like Univision or, or I felt like the root was kind of dragging her feet a little bit. Okay. So I ended up going, you know, and there was another offer that was, that was really, really good. And we ended up going with, we ended up actually signing a letter of intent um, with that, with that second offer. So since then, that was two thousand and this was announced. That was two thousand sixteen. How's it changed your life? Well, let me. I'm I'm not done with that yet. So we signed a letter of intent with that second offer, and that ended up falling through. Okay. Because Eesh. they didn't have the capital. Okay. Maybe I'm not sure exactly what happened, and so when I told Donna about this that I was going with another, you know, with another entity, she was, you know, said that she was disappointed, but also said that hey, if things change, you can always come back, okay. and we could just reengage the talks. Okay. So we reengaged the talks that fall, and um, and by the next summer, you know, the the deal was um deal was done. I feel like I'm missing some steps <laughs> right now, but, um, but yeah, so, so yeah, the deal actually ended up going through in, um, in 2017. Wow. So you went from employee, employer to employee, well, yeah, employer to employee. Yeah. Yeah. Now I, um, I do not own VSB anymore. Pamela and I don't own it anymore. We work, we work for it. We run it. And nothing has changed editorially. I mean, we're still we're, we're still able to do everything that we did before acquisition. It's just now we get a salary, and and we are part of that whole Gizmodo Media Group network with like you know Deadspin and Jezebel and you know all those other sites. And so we're part of like a part of like a team, I guess, a, a big team instead of being our own entity. That. I think it's kind of the um, the dream of the internet entrepreneur to sell their property. Why? Why do you think VSB was so sellable? Um, I I I think that our you know the, the sort of content that we were known for just is very um, irreverent, snarky, voicey, and aggressive. Um, Aggressive and also very nimble mm-hmm. way of 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 tackling race and tackling um, pop culture and politics and just regular day to life sort of thing that was attractive to 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 uh, quite a few larger entities. I mean, GMG was interested, but there were a few others who approached us with with, with similar sort of offers and. Um, you know, between that and the following and the traffic that, that we had, I, you know, I guess that that's what made us attractive. And then, I mean, that went from, that blew up, went well, and then now you have a book deal and you have a book, actually, that's, that is out called What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Blacker. Yeah. Yo, first of all, you... <laughs> I've been looking. I've been looking forward to this book because, for those of us who've been in in the internet world for such a long time, being able to see our words in print is important. You also had Honey, um, design your cover. So for mm-hmm. you, what does this book mean, and why was this the right time to to write it? Um, well, the book is. I, I feel like another way to look at VSB 
you know, just in the bull context is that it's been, it's been a way to workshop. It's mm-hmm. been, it's been a way for me to like experiment and, and try different ways of, of writing. Like on V, like if you go back on VSB, I've done fan fiction. I've done like mm-hmm. narrative things. I've done like invented emails. I've done conversations with myself. I've done like reactive 300 word long pieces and 2000 word long pieces recaps. So all these different ways of like of of creating content in in ways that have that are distinct structurally um and even creatively and all of that experience is kind of fused together and um and I feel like this book is is a combination of that um it's also it's also, you know, for people who are familiar with me from VSB, they might be surprised um, at what they find in the book. Because the book is not like, it's it's not like a VSB book. Right. It's a, it's a Damon book. It's, it's. And, and people who have even, um, I've seen this actually in a couple of reviews that I've read so far where people were anticipating a book full of like VSB like content. So, mm-hmm. okay, this is a chapter about white privilege. This is a chapter about like the cookout. This is a chapter about potato salad ranked or, you, you know, just this shit like that. This is a chapter about Kanye West. And, um, and this book is a memoir. And it's um, now there are a lot of those racial and cultural insights are inserted in this book, um, but it's it's much more vulnerable, much more transparent, much more personal than than the things that I tend to write about on VSB. Um, like there's there's the uh, a common thread throughout the book is this this idea of anxiety and, and, yeah. and fear and angst and self consciousness. And how that kind of governs and guides the, the the decisions I make and don't make, and that's a thread that kind of exists throughout the book. And those are things that I never really got into that deeply on VSB because I the 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 mechanism of blogging this doesn't really allow for that space, and also too because I just didn't feel as comfortable doing it because I needed the space, I needed the words. Like if I'm going to go there, I need to be able to go there the way I um I, I want to, um, and the way I need to. You are deeply vulnerable in this book, and yeah, like you said, in terms of blogging, not giving the space for you as a black man writer. Um, how do you constantly push yourself in these moments when you're like, "Who should I put this on paper?" Um. I, you know, I, um, the thing that, that kind of guided me, you know, at least with that through this process is that I wanted to write the best book that I could. And I can't do that. I couldn't have done that without that transparency. Like I'm not, I'm not Black Panther. I'm not, this isn't like a superhero origin story. Right. You know, if I'm going to write if you're going to write a book about yourself, you have to be, you're, you're already the protagonist because that's just assumed, but you have to be a bit of the antagonist too. Mm. Like you, you, you know, you have to expose some vulnerabilities. You have to expose some parts of you that are unflattering because if you don't do that, then there aren't things in there that people are going to be able to relate to because those things are the things that make us human. Like, you know, yeah, I have this very, specific experience as this black man growing up in Pittsburgh who played basketball, had this blog, now has a wife and a family, has this book, whatever. But if you remove all of those things and get into like the guts of what makes me me, that's where I think that's where the bulk of the content and that's where, you know, and that's where that connection comes from is that, you know, everyone has experienced anxiety. Mm. everyone has been self-conscious about a thing. Facts. You know, um, now there are different measures that we take to 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 shield that or maybe perform or, or pretend 
but those are very human, very real things. And and again, in order for this book to be the best book that it could be, I needed to I, I needed to insert those things in it because it's real. And also too, I I I think that the parts of the book that are funny draw from from that angst and that anxiety and stuff too. Like that's where the humor comes from. It doesn't just come from you know, you not experience an adversity or you not feeling fear or you not, you know, feeling doubt. It's um the humor comes from your reaction to those things. Do you and, have any and just the absurdity of, of existing while black in America. Which there's so many absurdities. Uh how do you want people to feel when they finish this book? What do you want them to walk away with? I I want them <laughs> I want them to feel full. Like I, I want I I, I want my book to be a thing like I don't want it to be I don't know like a like a rice bowl Chipotle I want them to actually feel like <laughs> oh this was worth this was worth the effort this was worth me reading this I feel full like I don't need to go and eat another meal right now maybe tomorrow you know but I don't need to go I don't need to go to McDonald's now mm-hmm. I can just I'm fine with what I ate I want them I want people to to be engaged i want people to be entertained i want people to to recognize that you know some of the things that that you might be going through with that you know going back to that angst and anxiety and 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 whatnot that those feelings are singular Mm. and you know i know that when you're going when people go through things like that it tends to make us feel like we're the only ones who are experiencing that um, and, and I think that writing about this, especially, you know, I'm like this black man who was a superstar athlete in high school, Yeah. you know, and in college. And it's like, I felt those things too. I still deal with those things today. Even if, you know, I, I've had some successes, you know, on paper, that hasn't changed like what's inside of me. That's real. That's real. This book is dope. Um, and I'm glad it's finally out. So one thing I always ask is, as you amazing guests that I get on this podcast, as you're writing and doing all these things, is what are you doing to take care of yourself? <laughs> um, I, 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 try, I try to hoop a few times a week. Like that's, 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 that's the thing that, you know, as long as I'm able to play basketball, I'm going to continue to play basketball. I also probably watch too much basketball. Um, like my, my wife would definitely agree with that, that the, with the latter that I, that I watch too much basketball. <laughs> um, I spend time with my, with my, my wife and my kids. Yes. You know, that's always like, that's always like energizing and, and validating in a way yes. just to just to just be on the couch with my family and just just doing nothing. Just sitting there and just watch not even even watching the TV's on but you're not even really watching. You're just sitting there. Um so you know that's what I do. And I also um I also eat a lot of bacon. Like bacon You eat a lot of bacon. Ba- yeah, bacon is, is definitely a form of self care. <laughs> Why am I not shocked? Well, I I I hope people pick up this book. What doesn't kill you makes you blacker. And Damon, what's are you doing a book tour? You doing all that? Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm doing a tour. Um, I'm, I'll like, I guess by the time this podcast is out, the tour will be out. Will be around, but yeah, I'll be. Um, um, I'll, I think I'll be in like 14 or 15 cities. Ooh, yep. I know that life. And, um, yeah, starting, uh, March, the book drops March 26th. My tour actually starts March 25th. And, um, and so, yeah, you'll, maybe you'll be seeing me in, in your city. And where can people find out about your tour? Um, you could go, you know, I'll be posting the tour stuff on Very Smart Brothers. There's also going to be a website, DamonJYoung.com, where you can find things. And also, if you follow me on Instagram or Twitter, it's DamonYoungVSB. Um, and I'll 
I'll be posting everything there. And also, I'll be posting stuff on VSB, too. So anything that you need to know about the tour will be on Very Smart Brothers. Awesome. Now, author, New York. Well, I'm, I'm going to say that this book is about to be New York Times bestselling <laughs> seller, selling books. So, Damon Young, you about to add another title to your uh, to your long list? Yeah, fingers crossed. Like we'll say, I, I got to catch up to you. Man, listen. My book agent's looking for me. So, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on Rant and Randomness. The people had to know who you were, your work, and hopefully they get this book and get and read VSB because that's where all the gems are outside of the print, which is brand new. Thank right, you thank so you. much for blessing me with your presence. Oh, thank you, lovey. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for blessing the world. With shenanigans. Blessing the world with loving. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to keep this going. And, and yeah, you're old. Uh, remember that. Never forget. <laughs> All right. We'll holler and let people know where to find you outside of social media. You assume people know very, VerySmartBrothers.com is um, the website. But where else do you actually hang out the most? I mean, you can find me in Pittsburgh. You know what? Nobody. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you feel like, <laughs> if you if you want to go there, I don't think your wife will want people looking for you in Pittsburgh. So I mean, you can you can meet me at the at the Ace Hotel. You don't have to come to the crib. You could meet me at the Ace. Um, I'm on I'm on Facebook a lot too. Like I'm 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 like I'm an old kid. Uh, I Facebook. Well, MySpace was the first social media platform I had that I had a profile with, but. After MySpace, there was Facebook, and I kind of just, I, I don't feel evolved enough for Twitter or to, like, really be active on Twitter or Instagram. So Facebook is still where I'm able to sprawl. All right, y'all. Go find Damon on Facebook. Find him on VerySmartBrothers.com <laughs> and pick up the book, What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Blacker. All right, Damon. Holla. All right. Bye. All right, so shout out to Damon Young for joining me. Y'all follow him on social media. If you are on Twitter, he is at Damon Young VSB. That's D A M O N Y O U N G V S B. Follow Very Smart Brothers on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. Um, and the short version is Very Smart Bros. So V E R Y S M A R T B R O S. Much love to Chicago Record the Company for partnering with me on this. Subscribe to Rants and Randomness on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, wherever you get it. And please rate it and leave a comment because you might just be featured on the show. Follow the podcast on social media, y'all. On Twitter, we're at Rants Randomness. On Instagram, Rants and Randomness. Now, you can email me any questions, any love, any suggestions to loveyrants at gmail.com. And as always, follow me on social. I am at lovey everywhere. See you on the next episode.